For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carlos Dodd, and the sleep surgery fell this year, following the steps of uh, our new attending, uh, Dr. Stanley Liu. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about, about a very good, very interesting topic. Uh, it's something that it's um, something that has to be very described uh, very often in the sleep apnea literature, but that we've been finding that it's more, more and more common in our sleep apnea patients, and especially I've been, we've been reviewing all our studies and uh, a common procedure that we do, like many of them, as part of the surgical evaluation, which is a drug induced sleep endoscopy. And we started to find out that uh, many of our patients actually are presenting with a very particular defining of epiglottic <coughs> collapse. Uh, and that's something that I want to describe, talk about possible causes for the epiglottic collapse. And uh, uh, finally, I'm gonna talk about different treatment options that are available right now. and. Uh, different ways that we can address it. Okay, so just continuing with uh, Dr. Jackler's, after Dr. Jackler's presentation last week, I thought it was a good idea to basically continue with this. And uh, thinking about it, there are a couple of similarities between uh, the epiglottis actually and, and electronic cigarettes. You can see, we got even the Brazilian cigarette here, Dr. Cabasso special, and uh, they, they, come, they come in all sorts of shapes. The epiglottis, we can find in all sorts of shapes in our, in our patients. We're just starting to find out also uh, what are some of the possible health-related consequences uh, that epiglottic collapse that can have in terms of sleep apnea and how much it is affecting our patients, how much of the symptoms that, we, that, that our patients are presenting might be related to epiglottic collapse. In the same way as we're trying starting to study electronic cigarettes and the health-related consequences of the electronic cigarettes. And, uh, and also, same way as electronic cigarettes are part of the evolution of the tobacco industry, we can see sleep apnea as part of human evolution, right? Uh, this is a quote that I like very much, it says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that's something that definitely applies for obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, how humans, in particular, compared to many of the other animal species are, that exist, are probably one of the few that suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. You see how as we started to depend more and, and, and started walking, uh, we started to depend less on the sense of smell and more on, on, on our vision. And what that caused is that there was a degeneration of the sense of smell where that allowed the, the larynx to basically uh, uh, descend. And one of the things that you see in many of the species that you don't see in animals, uh, in humans, is basically that there's a contact between the soft palate and the epiglottis, and part of the reason for that is that increases or enhances the sense of smell because it allows them to eat and breathe at the same time. In our in our case, uh, uh, what what happens is that there was a descent in the larynx, which actually led to the development of a real oropharynx, which doesn't exist in many animals. Actually, there are even animals like whales where the where their larynx is going to be directly like, connected to the skull base. So. We are really one of the few, or the only, the only species that only has an oropharynx, mainly for the purpose of speech. Right? We're the only one that has a very developed and complicated uh, mechanism of speech, and for that reason, we have developed an oropharynx that is what is uh, highly involved in sleep apnea and has a greater tendency for collapse. And this is actually what we see in many of our patients. Patients that have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, they're going to be collapsing at different patterns and, and different locations, like for example, here at running at some point because I have a bunch of videos. Oh, cool. There you go. So, yeah. For example, there's an example here of a palatal collapse that we can see. Uh, basically, you're having an anterior-posterior kind of pattern where the posterior pharyngeal wall and the soft palate are contacted completely. Uh, and uh, there's actually, in this, in this image here, you don't see any contribution from the lateral pharyngeal walls. It's mainly like an anterior-posterior collapse classic from the palate, and you can see uh, collapse at the level of the oropharynx. Uh, lateral pharyngeal walls in a circumferential type of pattern that obstructs completely and obviously uh, doesn't allow any airflow to go uh, lower down the windpipe. Similarly, uh, in the case of tongue obstruction at the level of the tongue base, Right, where you see 
and this image there's a contribution of the tongue base moving posteriorly in an anterior posterior fashion with some uh, contribution from the lateral pharyngeal walls and then you have this which is basically it's going to be the main it's a very interesting pattern actually where you see it's obstructing completely the, the laryngeal inlet uh, very different from what we see in many of our sleep apnea patients from what is described in the literature where typically they talk about a collapse at the level of the palate, at the level of the tongue base. Uh, and when they talk, talk about the hypopharynx, they may, mainly focus on, 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 on either on the lateral pharyngeal walls or the tongue base. But the epiglot is something that they don't really mention very much in the literature and they don't discuss. Uh, so we really don't know much about it. But recently we've been... Uh, uh, finding that a lot of our patients are actually presenting with a pilotic collapse. I'm just going to go about some of the basic stuff that you heard me demo of times that I need to include in my presentation at some point uh, about sleep apnea. Uh, as we all know, sleep apnea is characterized by the repeated episode of obstructed airway occlusion during sleep. Uh, here in the United States, about 9% of women and 25% of men are affected by, by obstructed sleep apnea, or are affected by diagnosis of obstructed sleep apnea. Uh, as we all know, and the reason why we treat it, one of the main reasons why we treat it is because of the health-related consequences it might have <coughs> cardiovascular level, neurocognitive, or uh, affecting people, their, their quality of life on a daily basis. The main treatment at this point continues to be the CPAP, uh, and it's the first time of treatment, and even us in our sleep surgery clinic, whenever we uh, have a patient that we diagnose with sleep apnea, the first time of treatment for them continues to be the CPAP. Uh, the problem is that only one third of the patients tolerate the CPAP, so they actually come back to our clinic eventually looking for alternatives, right? either either surgery or either uh, some other uh, alternatives of, such as uh, uh, oral appliances. The thing is that in order for these devices and for surgery to be effective, we have to do we have to select our patients properly, and that is a challenge. That is a challenge that we have right now. Uh, in terms of making the correct diagnosis, diagnosis, the diagnosis of where the obstruction is happening in these patients. Many of these patients, whenever we're suspecting that they're having sleep apnea, the first step is to order a polysomnogram, sleep study, all right, which is the only tool we have right now to make a diagnosis of sleep apnea. The problem with it is that it doesn't provide any information in terms of where the obstruction is happening, all right? And same thing, once we start treating with the CPAP, we're treating the whole airway. So we're not considering any area in particular that, that, that might be collapsing. So we're not making a full assessment of where is the problem and what is collapsing. Many different uh, uh, systems have been developed and classification systems have been developed in order to try to determine where the obstruction is happening, like the Fujita classification uh, that describe three types of, uh, uh, of levels of collapse, basically, Level one at the level of the palate, level three at the level of the tongue base, and then level two, which is a combination of palate and, and, and tongue base and a hypopharynx. Then the Friedman uh, a system, which we all uh, probably heard of, uh, basically takes into consideration the BMI, the size of the tonsil, and also the palate position in relation to the tongue. Uh, and then more recent systems that use basically um, the, the, the um, dice or drug industry endoscopy as part of the evaluation, which are the both in the nose. Traditionally, as part of the evaluation and the way we try to identify the site of obstruction, well, the, the most common used tool is a Mueller maneuver uh, when we're doing the flexible laryngoscopy examination in the clinic, where we ask the patient to take a deep inspiration with a pinched nose to order, in order to determine where the airway might be collapsing at the retropalatal or the retrolingual level. But as many studies have shown, and from our own experience, usually the Mueller maneuver doesn't correlate very well with the findings that we have in drug induced endoscopy. So it helps for, uh, for some purposes, for example, for lateral pharyngeal wall, determining if the lateral pharyngeal wall is going to collapse or not. But although other findings, such as epiglottic collapse, for example, is not very useful. All right? So this is a challenge that we have, uh, trying to identify where exactly the different patterns of collapse are happening and, and, what it's, and the location where they're happening. So these are basically some of the papers, uh, very, very classic papers in the sleep apnea literature uh, that, are, are, that are part of the evaluation of patients for, for surgery. Uh, the SHARE system, which basically 
takes into account the, the Friedman, uh, the, the Friedita classification system that I mentioned about, uh, and and talks about the success of UP3. He, he, he talks about a 70% success of UP3 in patients with a type 1 Friedita classification, where basically they're only obstructing at the level of the palate. And then the other more common papers that probably at some point in our training we, 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 we've seen are it's like the Friedman classification system, where patients that have a uh, palate position one, where you can actually see the entire palate, uh, and have some that tonsils between size three and four, plus three and plus four, uh, and obviously the BMI below 40, you have a 80% chance of uh, having successful treatment with UP3 alone, or, or the obstructive sleep apnea. Then one of the other challenges and one of the other problems, not problems, but uh, one of the possible reasons why epiglottic collapse has not been recognized as an important contributor to sleep apnea is that one of the most common uh, surgical protocols that have been used up to this point, which is the palate writing protocol uh, that was described in the 90s, basically includes a phase one and a phase two, uh, uh, where the phase one, patients that are diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea after they're evaluated in the clinical straight for soft tissue surgery, usually addressing any obstruction at the level of the nose, level of the palate, or the level of the hypopharynx, particularly the tongue base, usually what they do in that phase is a combination of septal surgery or turbinates, uh, some type of UP3 or palatal surgery afterwards, and then in terms of addressing the hypopharynx, they can do either geniaglossal advancement, many times for, for some time they did a combination of geniaglossal advancement uh, with high suspension, so it's basically uh, it's a surgical protocol that doesn't take into consideration the particular, the specific areas that might be collapsing, all right? So they go straight for the surgery after making the diagnosis, having about an idea of where the problem might be. Um, after that phase one surgery, and, and the results for them has been like between 40 to 75% of the patients actually are cured uh, after phase one surgery. If the patient still has obstructive sleep apnea, a, when a PSD or a poly, uh, a sleep study is repeated three months after the surgery, if they still have a sleep apnea, then they move on to, to the second, the phase two surgery, which is basically skeletal surgery, uh, which basically consists of maximal mandibular advancement. Some of the factors that they uh, found that predicted the patients were not going to be successful, uh, successfully treated after phase one surgery are basically having an elevated RDI, significant desaturations, some skeletal deficiency or mandibular deficiencies or a BMI greater than 33, all right? But it was uh, in 1991, um, we started with a, with a new diagnostic tool which is called the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, which basically is a way of evaluating our patients after giving some sedation. And what we're trying to do is to replicate sleep in this patient so we can take a look behind the palate, behind the tongue, and then we can understand the pattern of collapse, the degree of collapse, uh, and, and that will allow us to come to, to design a better surgical plan for our patients, right? Um, it was popularized in 2011 um, with a paper called the Bolt Classification System that is using drug sleep endoscopy. It was published by Casiria and De Vries. Uh, both here from, graduated from, from, from the Stanford Fellowship of Sleep Surgery. Uh, and the basic way that, it's a very simple, it's, uh, some people argue it's very simplistic, but it's a way that uh, it's a common language for everyone to, to basically uh, evaluate these patients and present the different patterns and degrees of collapse. So you can see the B starts up from the both the B starts for the velo, where basically you can have uh, anterior posterior at the level of the palate, you can have anterior posterior, lateral, or concentric collapse. And then this can be scored as a one or two, depending on whether one will be a partial or two will be a complete collapse. At the level of the oropharynx, you can only have lateral wall collapse, all right? At the level of tongue base, the only way you can see collapse is gonna be in an anterior posterior pattern. And then the epiglottis, you can have two pattern, patterns of collapse, which I'm gonna present a couple of videos later, which can be an anterior posterior type of collapse or a lateral uh, collapse. Uh, before they use, uh, for, for the sedation, they, they used to use, they, they use midazolam or propofol. We have changed in terms of our sedation uh, selection, and now we're using Presidex just for the uh, simple reason that Presidex doesn't seem to 
relax the muscles and doesn't affect the pharyngeal uh, the pharyngeal dilator 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 muscles. So it's a better replication of what's actually going on during sleep. Okay, and these are the different patterns of collapse. So you can see at the level of the velum, this is this is normal. A is normal. Uh, B is a partial collapse. C is a complete collapse, like the video that I presented before, and then D will be a concentric collapse. Uh, the level of the oropharynx, same thing. You can have either a complete collapse, like here, like a D, partial, partial like a, a, a C and B. Also, an important contributor of oropharyngeal collapse will be the tonsils. Here's the epiglottis over here, and these are the tonsils. So basically, uh, that's, that's important in the description of oropharyngeal collapse, whether the tonsils are present or not. On base, like I mentioned, you can have partial or complete anterior posterior collapse, like like this picture show. This looks like more like a like a complete, but there's, there's some space there, so it's a partial. These are complete here, and then at the epiglottis, you can have uh, two different types of collapse, right? Uh, the anterior posterior collapse, like the video that I presented before, or the one where actually it's like lateral, where where it's more more similar to the type of collapse you see in children with learning in Malaysia, right? Where it's a, it's kind of folds upon itself. So when I started seeing all this information, or all these videos that we collected, we actually have a pretty big collection. Uh, I, I revised 124 videos that we have. Uh, now we have even more than that. Something that, that caught my attention and it was very interesting is that I was noticing, like I mentioned before, a lot of our patients were having epiglottic collapse, particularly the anterior posterior type of collapse. Although this was very common as well. Okay? Uh, and then when I started revising these videos, I noticed that 25% of our patients actually had epiglottic collapse, which is a very high number to compare to what I thought. Because uh, before I came here, really, I, I, I really didn't read much about the, the literature that was there uh, about epiglottic collapse, but I, I never heard much about it. Usually they read about the hypopharynx, the palate, and everything, but you don't hear much about epiglottic. But for me, that was a pretty high number. That, uh, that I noticed in, in general characteristics of our patient population is that most of them were going to be male, as is expected in the sleep apnea population. Most of them are going to be uh, <coughs> males compared to female. That actually has an evolutionary explanation to, to, to it as well. Uh, um, and then age, I divided them from 20 to 35, from 36 to 50 and then from 51 to 65 so actually the distribution was pretty good but something that's very important here to notice is that younger patients were presenting with epiglottic collapse as well which is very interesting you would expect from from just without even reading about the literature or anything you would expect older people to have it but something that I definitely when we're discussing about this is that a lot of our younger patients were presenting with this problem uh, and then the BMI as you can see also is not something that is Many of our sleep apnea patients obviously are overweight or obese, and uh, here a lot of the patients were actually at a normal uh, BMI between 18 and 25. And the apnea hypopnea index was evenly distributed among them. Uh, uh, a lot of the patients were presenting with mild, some were presenting with severe, but it was evenly distributed as well. And then a lot of the patients didn't desaturate significantly afterwards, didn't desaturate. One important thing that I did, I did include here in this part is that the F word of these patients was, was actually lower than 10. So a lot of them weren't reporting that they were feeling sleepy. It's more that they were feeling fatigued or tired during the day. And that was like the main, the main symptom in many, many of them. Uh, so when I started looking back into the literature and looking and, and to understand a little bit more about the role of the epiglottis in, in OSA, Notice that this is under, definitely underreported uh, problem in the, in the sleep apnea literature. You don't see a lot of papers or at all discussing this problem, uh, particularly in the adult population. It's estimated from the literature that is out there that 10% of the patients 
uh, that have sleep apnea actually present with epi lotus obstruction, which is very different from the 25% that I found in our patient population from the sample that I had. Uh, and then some of the more common findings that were described in patients with epiglottic collapse was a choking sensation whenever they were using the CPAP, and it actually makes sense because all that air and pressure actually are pushing the epiglottis down and kind of obstructing the glottis and, and the entrance into the lungs. And uh, another, another typical finding was that when you saw these patients in the clinic and you, do the, you did a flexible laryngoscopy, you were gonna see that the epiglottis was almost positioned against the back of the throat, which from my experience in watching these videos is not something that I'm very sure of. Uh, you see a lot of patients that actually have posteriorly displaced epiglottis, but for some reason it doesn't collapse. But in others, definitely that's something that's common in patients that do have some collapse, but uh, it's not a determining factor, okay? And then um, reviewing all the literature that talks about the epiglottis and, and uh, different evaluations of the airway, I did find two classification systems that I found pretty interesting uh, about the position that describes the position of the epiglottis in relation to the larynx. Uh, uh, the catapulmo is one of the few papers that actually talks about epiglottis, epiglottic collapse in sleep apnea patients. And it talks about the, the position of the epiglottis when it's collapsing. collapsing. So basically, it gives a description of a partial versus complete collapse, where three will be a complete collapse and uh, zero will be no, where the epiglottis has, has a direct relationship <coughs> with the tongue is not moving at all. And then uh, Unsun, uh, this is a very interesting paper um, uh, that takes into consideration patients that have hypopharyngeal obstruction that, have, that, are, that are unconscious and uh, they're evaluating the jaw thrust maneuver and how that stabilizes the airway. And uh, one of the, the classified, one of the criteria and, and grading that they use is in terms of evaluation, the position of the epiglottis. Uh, this is something, uh, curiously, that we talked about before I, I discovered this classification system, which is basically uh, correlating how the, the epiglottis and the position of the epiglottis uh, correlates with the visualization of the vocal cords. We've seen that uh, in, in pediatric patients uh, that suffer from laryngomalacia, but in adult patients, yeah, it's never been described that I was aware of. And it's actually very interesting, and I think it's a very common tool, especially if we're thinking that patients that have sleep apnea and that have epiglottic collapse, uh, one of the reasons might be the position of the epiglottis. So this is actually a very useful tool for that purpose that I think it's worth studying a little bit further. Um, and then the role of the epiglottis in snoring. is something we talk about palatal, uh, vibration and, and being the, the site of, uh, of snoring in most of the patients, that is true. But uh, few studies have looked at the frequencies and the site of obstruction uh, during, during snoring. And this was one very interesting paper that I found, uh, published by Queen in 2005. And basically what they did is that they selected a group of 50 patients that uh, were snorers but did not have a, have a diagnosis of sleep apnea to determine what, where was the setup of, 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 of snoring that was going on. Uh, they did confirm that palatal snoring alone occurs in 70% of the patients. However, there's a combination of palatal plus epiglottic collapse in, in, in 10% of the patients, uh, more than tonsillar or tongue phase. So, and then the epiglottis will collapse on its own and be the, sort of, the source of, uh, of snoring in 2% of the patients. So if you take the 10% of combination with the palatal snoring, plus the 2% of the epiglottis being the sole source of, of snoring, then it's involving around 12% of patients that snore. So actually, it is something that's very important. Uh, uh, a couple of, I had a patient at the VA that we operated a couple of weeks ago, uh, did a full phase one surgery. The guy's doing great and everything, but still complete, complaining a little bit about snoring. Uh, I didn't do drug induced sleep endoscopy before the surgery. And now, when I saw him back in the clinic, he was feeling great and everything, but still complained about snoring. When I saw him, the epiglottis is posterior in his face. So I'm planning, my plan is to take him back now, do a drug induced sleep endoscopy to confirm that actually the epiglottis might be the source of, of snoring and, uh, and then address it directly. So, here are some examples of how the epiglottis might contribute to snoring. See here, we got some space, so there's not a complete obstruction. 
you can see how the vibration of the snoring, I wish we had sound so we could uh, hear the snoring. And it's actually the frequency. If you try to reproduce it, you reproduce it yourself. I'm not going to do it here. But uh, if, you try <laughs> if you try to do it, the snoring and the frequency actually is very different when you're snoring from higher in your airway than from the hypopharynx. There, here's the other pattern of collapse of the epiglottis that I talked about that can be for the snoring as well, where it kind of folds up on itself. Can I, can I ask you about that? At yes. what point the Israelis were putting a microphone and being able to predict the side of the thing? What's happened to the validity of that? That would be interesting. We're not doing that without that. Is, that is there any, any there validity is a, to there it? There is a guy in England who wrote or who developed something that on the sound analysis. Is it valid? On paper. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, possibly yes. I would think so. So now we confirmed that that a lot of our patients are presenting with a big lung collapse. So what could be the different causes? Could be could this be a weak larynx that we are seeing? Uh, some larynx uh, that were some sort of neurological problem that is presenting as obstructive sleep apnea. Could it be related to the occlusal angle, uh, which we know contributes significantly to obstructive sleep apnea? Could it be related to the height position? Could it be related then or to the, the fact that we have a lax high epiglottic ligament, which from my impression is something that gives some sort of support to the epiglottis? Uh, and I think it's worth looking back into the, the pediatric literature about laryngomalacia and laryngomalacia. Since we know it is the most common source of strider in, in, in many children, um, there are a couple of theories of what may cause the laryngomalacia, right? But uh, one of the main uh, things that have been described as a cause is it actually immature cartilages or an immature neuromuscular tone of the larynx. It is very frequently associated with GERD, uh, which is something that is very common in our sleep apnea patients. Actually, uh, some people. <coughs> mentioned that about 100 percent of the patients that have sleep apnea also suffer from GERD, uh, not the other way around. Uh, the presenting symptoms so that it's, uh, or it's a little bit the presentation is a little bit later a, a little bit different from from the presentation in patients with, uh, with epiglottic collapse in, in OSA. Here in children it's usually high pitch strider. In our patients it's just usually when they're sleeping there's some they snore or obstruct. Um, the spontaneous history of the laryngomalacia is that it actually results about, by itself at one or two years when the, once the cartilages or the, muscular, the neuromuscular problem uh, matures completely. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, then there are different indications. And then the patient continues with failure to drive or cyanotic spells and all that, then there's a silent indication for surgery. Uh, commonly, the, when, when a uh, infant has laryngomalacia, the common side of obstruction are going to be or the way the, the pattern of collapse is going to be an inward collapse of the outer epiglottic folds, a long tubular epiglottic that curls up on itself, uh, like our patients, a posterior inspiratory displacement of the epiglottis. So you see the pattern of, pattern of collapse of uh, infant laryngomalacia, and the one that we're seeing in our patients is very similar. So there might be a correlation between infant laryngomalacia uh, and adult what we will call like an adult or acquired laryngomalacia in adults that, that is presenting as obstructive sleep apnea. So when you look at, for more information about adult onset laryngomalacia, uh, there, there really isn't a lot of information about this. And uh, from what I recall, you don't read a lot about this in, in, in the ENT books or anything. It's, it's uh, something that I just learned preparing this presentation. And actually, it's because there isn't a lot of information out there about it. Uh, in a study that was published by Hay, it, she did a comprehensive, she actually presented a, a case of laryngomalacia and then did a, like a literature review. It, there were no meta-analyses, no randomized controlled trials, no cohort studies about the management of adult onset laryngomalacia. Most of the information that we have is basically case reports uh, that talk about adult laryngomalacia. Most of them are gonna be males, of the 28, 20 of them were males. And they were basically divided into two different groups. The ones that had a idiopathic type of adult onset laryngomalacia and the acquired. Of the 22 cases that were acquired, uh, which were the majority of them, 14 of them would be neurological causes, uh, seven of them iatrogenic causes, and then um, 
including head and neck cancer and treatment for head and neck cancer, and one of them will be traumatic. Right? The, the typical symptom will be the same thing as many of our patients or, or even children that are in Malaysia, uh, which will be strider, dyspnea, an exertion, obstructive sleep apnea, and dysphonia. I actually find this in, quite important and, uh, and, and interesting because maybe, maybe uh, the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea is what's leading to uh, the, the, the will be a secondary finding of this patients having some sort of adult learning dominatia. So that's something worth studying a little bit further too, I think. Um, the most common clinical findings in these patients are gonna be, uh, we're gonna be, it's gonna be posterior collapse, 61% um, of the patients, just like our patient with a, with a epiglottic collapse, or the, the presentation where it was gonna occur, curl up on itself. Here is a, I'm not gonna go over this, but basically, this presents all the, the 28 cases and uh, different the presentation and the different uh, causes for the for the adult onset learning in Malaysia. And then continuing with it in the same in the same line, uh, I decided to look about hypoglottic ligament and how it might be affecting uh, or contributing to a glottic collapse in obstructive sleep apnea. I actually found a very very interesting paper. I think this paper is very very nice. Uh, it's, it was a histological study that was done to determine the age-related changes in the hypoglottic ligament. Uh, and one of the very interesting findings of this study was actually that a uh, different from, from what we understood before that they had the, the hypoglottic ligament basically was a connection between the epiglottis and the hyoid. There's actually a second <coughs> branch of the hypoglottic ligament that is connected directly to the tongue base. Okay. So that's part of the rationale for thinking that either doing a hyoid advancement or hyoid suspension or doing a genioglossal advancement might actually take care of any problem at the level of the epiglottis. All right? Uh, we know about the role of the hyoepiglottic ligament, and they describe it in this paper very well in terms of swallowing. So whenever there is a, what the, the approximation of the thyroid and the hyoid bone kind of stretches the hyoepiglottic ligament, that's going to be kind of a... a that's going to lead to a contraction of the aeropiglottic fold. That's going to lead, lead to a retoration of the epiglottis, and actually direct the foot bolus into the esophagus. And then after all the action completes, there's a relaxation there where the cartilage and the epiglottis actually uh, returns back to its normal position. Something that's very interesting and, and very common, and the, the, the finding, the main finding of this study, was that in elderly patients, there was a decrease in the number of elastic, collagen, and muscle fibers, which may, might be uh, part of the reason why older patients might have a greater tendency to develop <coughs> sort of this problem of epiglottic collapse or even adult onset learning of Asia. Then we move on to study some of the other factors that might be contributing to obstructive sleep apnea. One of the most important things being the craniofacial characteristic of our patients, which we know can lead to obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, one of the most common variables uh, that are related to obstructive sleep apnea is basically an increased distance from, of the height from the mandibular plane, uh, a decrease in the mandibular and the maxillary projection, a downward and posterior rotation of the facial development, or an increased vertical length of the upper airway. So we know the height also, also plays a very important role in terms of, uh, of uh, stabilizing our patients and the airway, a patient with obstructive sleep apnea is it serves as a central anchorage for the tongue muscles uh, and many of the other muscles that are called like the pharyngeal dilator, dilator, dilator muscles that are in charge of keeping the airway open during sleep and when, I, and when we're awake. However, uh, taking that into consideration, we're looking back for some uh, studies that uh, have looked at changes in, in the high position, for example, or craniofacial changes in terms of uh, Improving obstructive sleep apnea. This is a very interesting study that was done. It was a uh, study that looked at changes in the MRI after high suspension. One of the things, and, and part of the reason why I think it's very interesting for this purpose is because one of the angles that they actually measure was the epiglottic angle here, taking into consideration angle from the mandible and then uh, through the epiglottis. You would, you would expect that if you want high suspension to take care of your epiglottic problem, you will try to increase that angle by bringing it forward, farther away from the posterior pharyngeal wall where it's collapsing. Uh, 
And then they also look at other measurements like how the high advancement might increase the retropalatal or the retrolingual area. They also look at the hyoid angle to determine how much hyoid suspension actually changed the angle of the hyoid or advanced. And their findings were actually pretty interesting in terms of they didn't find that the epiglottis, uh, that angle changed significantly after hyoid suspension. It was basically what they did is was a uh, high suspension to the thyroid cartilage. There's another way that you can do it to the mandible, which might bring it a little bit more forward and just pulling it forward towards the hyoid. But still, they didn't find significant changes in terms of that angle and how high suspension might contribute to, to preventing epiglottic collapse. And the same thing, they didn't find significant changes in terms of the other angles, including the hyoid angle. Uh, so one of them, basically the conclusion of the paper was that, that hyoid advancement more than increasing the space or preventing collapse of structures such as the epiglottis, but it's actually doing, it's increasing the tone by increasing the tone preventing collapse. And then we, we look at other craniofacial characteristics. This is very <coughs> common in our sleep apnea patients that you see this occlusal angle, where it's kind of a uh, increased second third of the face, uh, a decrease in the lower third, and it's, uh, with a little bit of sort of retrognathia, uh, and deficiency of the mandible. So one of the things that we're trying to do with many of our patients when we operate them, besides advancing the skeletal framework, is also to kind of rotate it to improve this occlusal angle here. Uh, and this is part of our, uh, the planning of our surgeries, right? For some of our patients, when we're, we're doing a, uh, uh, some of the planning that we're gonna do uh, for, for them, and kind of just change what we use for, for the surgery. And actually, one of the things that we look at and try to do is to change that angle as much as possible to make it as straight as possible. Uh, and by in that way, we're tensing the entire airway, okay? So like I mentioned before, this one of the main craniofacial findings that we see um, in, in our sleep apnea patient is kind of a downwards um, angle. And uh, what we do, we have had some experience with some patients uh, where we actually, after doing the MMA, the higher position wasn't changed significantly, although we, we it's important that I mention that we've had some patients where the high position changes dramatically after MMAs, but it's very inconsistent from 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 these examples that I'm presenting here. Uh, and basically, there's a pre CT scan, post CT scan. You can see the increase in the airway, how open and every, everything is here, how stable that airway is, and there's only like a slight rotation. There's a, not a significant change in the higher position, and then. In terms of epiglottic collapse, more importantly, I think it's uh, this very interesting that MMA, even though it's the most successful surgery that we have in terms of treating our sleep apnea because it stabilizes the entire airway, uh, it doesn't address, in some of our patients that we had epiglottic collapse, it doesn't address epiglottic collapse. That's something that is actually super, very interesting because that means is that the epiglottis is acting on, on itself, and, and, and treatment for the epiglottis needs to be designed specifically for epiglottic collapse. So, so here in this video, you can see how the epiglottis is collapsing here. You can see how unstable the lateral pharyngeal walls and everything are. And then when we, did the, when we do the post-MMA, you see how stable and open the airway is, but the epiglottis down there is still collapsing. I find extremely interesting. Hmm. And uh, I have some videos of the same thing, patients that had epiglottic collapse before. I don't have the pre-MMA drug industry endoscopies, but after the MMA, epiglottic collapse is something that persists in, in, in both patterns, when it's uh, folding up on itself or an anterior posterior can collapse. And needless to say, this patient has an apnea hypopnea in the top four. See. So if he's from, from, from the treatment, from, from the perspective of treating sleep apnea, this guy's cured. But he does refer in the clinic that when you look back to the notes and, and, uh, and his complaints, he's feeling a little bit tired. Okay. So this might be the fact, that this might be contributing to it. But the, guy, the, the patient isn't saturated significantly, has an apnea hypopnea index of four. So in terms of treatment, <coughs> There's really, you, you cannot do much more than addressing probably that epiglottic collapse. 
Same thing, here's another patient with the same thing. So we actually have three patients that are uh, post-MMA that still have some sort of epiglottic collapse. Now basically, when you look at the literature and uh, you look at MMAs as a, as a uh, tool for the treatment of sleep apnea, you go back to, to the original papers published by Riley and, and Powell, and, and, and you're gonna see that their understanding of how MMAs improve obstructive sleep apnea is that it actually decreases the collapsibility of the lateral pharyngeal wall. So it tenses everything, but it's, they don't mention how it might address, for example, uh, epiglottic collapse, which is something that obviously from those examples that I presented persist. So what are the different treatment options that we have for these patients? They can be CPAP. Well, these are basically the different treatments that we can offer them. It's a combination of CPAP, positional therapy, mandibular advancement devices or appliances, or surgery. Right? And when you look at the literature and the few cases that have been reported about epiglottic collapse, there are a couple of papers that have presented how the use of CPAP might, might actually make it worse for these patients. Huh. All right? Because actually what you're doing is that you're blowing air, you're blowing pressure, and you're pushing that epiglottis down, so you're closing the glottis completely. So it might actually make it worse. It's not, in, they, they, these are basically case reports. Uh, uh, there are some cases where patients that are that are presented in, in other in other forms of the, in other parts of the literature they presented patients that do have epiglottic collapse but not necessarily uh, are affected by the CPAP they do gain some benefit and, and some of the patients that we have actually when they come to our clinic some of them complain of suffocation and feeling uh, that the CPAP is making them feel they're not getting any air but some of them feel a slight improvement and the main reason why they want surgery is because they don't want to use the machine anymore. Tired of it, which is very common. Uh, so, in terms of what other options we can offer other than the CPAP, we can of, of, offer a mandibular advancement devices. And actually, as part of the evaluation of the tract induced sleep endoscopy, we do two maneuvers where we close the mouth of the patient or we do a jaw thrust. And in many of these patients, <coughs> we see that how whenever there's some sort of hypopharyngeal collapse, including a glottic collapse, there's a really risk good stabilization of the airway when you do that. And whenever there's epiglottic collapse, it stops collapsing. Whenever there's tongue base, many times it stops collapsing. And from previous study, that has re uh, suggested that dice and those findings uh, can give us an idea of whether mandibular appliances are gonna help or not, or the oral appliances are gonna help or not. So there are no really, I mean, we, we can assume that they might work in terms of having, helping with epiglottic collapse, but there are no studies to confirm this. Okay, so these are the maneuvers that we do. And, uh, then in terms of positional therapy, same thing. When we're doing drug induced sleep endoscopy, many times we change the head position of the patients and we see how collapse of the oropharynx, oropharynx or hypopharynx and, uh, and the epiglottis actually stabilizes afterwards. And here's something, when I, when I was showing this presentation to Dr. Cavazzo, that he, he took notice, and I think it's very, very interesting. Obviously, you see how position, this paper talks about how a positional therapy is gonna help in terms of uh, reducing a collapse at the different levels, particularly at epiglottis. You had 46 patients that had a complete collapse, and then after positional therapy where where they changed the head position, it went down to 14. And same thing with partial, the number increased because some of the patients with complete collapse actually move on to partial collapse. But this is what's very interesting. Here, they used the, they evaluated 67 patients. 46 of them had a complete epiglottic collapse, which doesn't correlate with what we see in the literature that 10% of them, actually 10% of patients actually have epiglottic collapse. So obviously, this is an underreported problem. And then what are the other, the other treatment options that are available uh, in terms of surgery? Uh, you can do epi epiglottectomy. This is uh, Carr and their group are doing, they're very, uh, uh, they're doing a lot of uh, work with, uh, with the TORS in terms of treating the hypopharynx and the tongue base, including the epiglottis uh, for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, this is a paper, uh, this is a study that they reported where they actually have 20 patients where we, they did the uh, tonsillectomy followed by a uh, paratopharyngoplasty. And they also addressed the hypopharynx <coughs> uh, by doing tongue-based reduction, mingle tonsillectomy, and also doing an epiglottectomy where they resected the upper one-third of the epiglottis. 
results are really good for these patients. Really good. Uh, have apnea hypopnea index went down uh, the mean from 41 to 13. Oxygen saturation reduced significantly. The hypoxic, uh, hypoxic time also reduced significantly. Edward and, uh, and the snoring improved significantly. My only concern with this type of approach is that this is not cancer. It's still sleep apnea. You're taking away part of the epiglottis. And, you know, that's the, 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 the risk and the, and the some of the outcomes of this surgery that might lead to aspiration and that kind of, kind of problems are things that I, I am a little bit concerned about by doing an epilotectomy. And there are other modifications that have been described in patients that have adult uh, laryngomalacia. And this is actually a, it's a case of a floppy epiglottis where instead of resecting or doing an entire epilotectomy of the upper one third, what they did using a KTP laser is basically type of resection here where the epiglottis actually keeps collapsing but there's a space now for her to go through pretty interesting uh, also the reason why they did it is because it will help, uh, help in terms of decreasing the aspiration so that's part of the rationale of why, why they designed this, this type of uh, development other alternatives that we have is epilotopexy uh, by doing a lingual tonsillectomy or not, depending on whether they are present or not. So basically, you remove the lingual tonsils, uh, or you denude part of the molecular here, and uh, and uh, a lingual surface of the epiglottis, and then you suture it together in, in order to prevent, allow them to heal together and prevent that collapse. The thing about this is that from our experience, and then what is reported in the literature is that it's very inconsistent, the findings, and the uh, also this, this surgery. Obviously you're suturing soft tissue to soft tissue. So whenever you're you're swallowing, activating those muscles of that pool, it's very unpredictable whether that suturing is gonna hold or not. Okay. Uh, this is very interesting actually found it's a study that they did a cadaveric study about um, reshaping of the epiglottic cartilage where they this was done with five uh, laryngeal specimens of so patients that had head and neck cancer laryngectomy but had no invasion of the epiglottis and this is based on the concept that the shape and position of the epiglottis actually contributes to obstructive sleep apnea. What they did here is using CO2 laser. They uh, basically, and this has been described for reconstructive purposes and photoplasty and, and uh, other types of reconstructive surgery. And what they did is with the, using the CO2 laser they basically reshaped the epiglottic cartilage so that it was uh, kind of hard <coughs> Uh, the tongue base. This is another uh, alternative that has been presented for patients that um, that have some. This was actually a patient that couldn't be cannulated because of epiglottic collapse. And what they did is basically they approached the pre epiglottic space by going in feeder, leaping feeder to the height. They did an incision in the cartilage and then they kind of sutured the proximal aspect of the epiglottic cartilage to the thyroid. But they, they call that like an anterior reposition. Well, the reason why I'm presenting this and the experience with other types of epiglottic collapse is because there really isn't a lot of uh, literature report in, in terms of uh, epiglottic collapse, uh, treatment for epiglottic collapse and obstructive sleep apnea. So we need to look at literature in other areas in order to come to with those solutions for this. And then the traditional techniques that I already mentioned, high suspension uh, and geniolosal advancement. But like I mentioned before, based on that paper, the, uh, the relationship of the high epiglottic ligament, it makes sense definitely to, to do these procedures for the purpose of treating the obstructive sleep apnea. However, we're not very sure how much it influences and changes, actually changes the position of the epiglottis uh, after doing this advancement. So in conclusion, basically, epiglottic collapse is an underreported problem, in, in definitely in the sleep apnea literature. Uh, we still need to learn a lot about it and the possible causes of uh, epiglottic collapse. Uh, we need to determine whether there, we need to treat epiglottic collapse since we're seeing that many of these patients actually don't have more than mild sleep apnea and what they complain of is just feeling tired. Uh, so we need to determine, what, first of all, how much that uh, epiglottic collapse is contributing to, to decreasing the flow of air and then to their symptoms. 
and definitely more research needs to be done uh, about uh, different treatment options to address the epiglottic collapse in sleep apnea patients. Thank you very much. Now we have some time for questions. Carlos, I want to say thank you. When you came with these ideas, I said, like, oh man, this is going to be boring. But actually, it's <laughs> a lot more exciting than I thought. This is a great work. Uh, we're doing all this. It ended up being very impressive. Sam actually brought a lot of good points. Sam most while we were here about possibility <laughs> of <on> this. <laughs> yes. About some and perhaps your your comment that it might be some of these um, perhaps some patients with obstructive deep up they have histological differences or, or the components of collagen and calcium may be different mm -hmm. in patients with deep up uh, uh, compared to controls or yeah. uh, or some of those. Uh, patients that we still see, uh, do you see anything on the line? Uh, maybe a word of project yeah. uh, to look in some of our patients uh, uh, working on the on the on the on the compounds some of the patients could be doing some sort of analysis and see that uh, the and 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 I think so we have a video in every lobectomy or something we can send that for analysis. Or even for in geo visuals. Yeah sure okay we could send that <laughs> Carlos, is there, do uh, you know of anybody looking into uh, potential sensors? Like, for example, theoretically, if you had a nasal trumpet, a really thin one, that could measure air turbulence, and you basically place it in, let's say, the right uh, piriform sinus from the nasal cavity down, while they're getting a sleep study, this device can measure air turbulence in the hypopharynx, oropharynx, uh, nasopharynx, and nasal cavity, and correlate it with the, uh, you know, the times they have obstructive events, um, and the sensor can pretty much give you your sleep endoscopy in the form of electrical data on the air turbulence. Uh. I know there, there, there's one study that came out, and I read it a couple of months ago in another angioscope, that it was, uh, they used like a nasal, kind of like a nasal trumpet, uh, but it was more to measure the success of palatal surgery more than to measure turbulence. Uh, but I don't think there's anything out there to, to that measures turbulence in terms of how that improves or because essentially that. that's what you're dealing with, is soft tissue increasing turbulence mm -hmm. leading to obstructive events mm -hmm. and there's they have sensors for almost anything. Mm -hmm. So there are there is actually uh, a good number of paper, uh, papers on pressure transducers yeah. and all the hypopharynx using there is this catheter that yeah. they're trying to use it for Mueller catheter. It is a uh, catheter that is usually used for, for for these blood vessels. So you can measure the pressure. Measure exactly the amount of negative pressure or not that some of those patients may generate, so you can somewhat predict the word it's just uh, from based on that. Um, there is one uh, paper showing uh, microphone and then showing sound and, and frequency and vibration difference between these structures. Uh, again, just one paper. So the bottom line is you should really partner up with engineers, and a sensor like that could be validated with a sleep study. Once you get that data, wouldn't it be simple to put a little sen sensor down, collect the data while the patient goes home and sleeps, yeah. and make objective data based on that so you don't have to send them to a sleep lab, which is a foreign environment, and hook them up to a bunch of you know, external sensors. Definitely. So <laughs> the, but the goals are two. There are several uh, sleep monitors that can send patients home that can diagnose them with sleep apnea. That one is not. But or is the structure? It's kind of the, the tricky part. So everybody well, that's what I'm talking about. Is the sensor can have uh, attachments at different levels that could correlate with the different levels of obstruction. True, but then the, the problem is, first of all, how do you put the sensor there in a, in a way that's a lot of water? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. in the pediatric yeah. world, they they stick nasal trumpets in kids <laughs> for airway, yeah, and, and they, they tolerate it pretty well. <laughs> but then you don't change it. So that's the, the closest thing is this thing called. Uh, that we have still cost $250, just one catheter. Uh, we are trying to get some. 
to to analyze those patients to really see this lesion does and kind of check in the location and in the modern area. So uh, yes, it is true, it is, but it's not that easy. Uh, right, and you can uh, what I think is that you will basically you can expect that you will sense collapse on the level of the palate at the level of the hypopharynx where it traditionally collapses, but you won't get an idea of the pattern of collapse, which I think is very important in terms of deciding what surgery you're gonna offer. Yeah, the, other, the other thing that we see sometimes, it's pretty, pretty interesting, it's just, they're probably the same. It's a lot of those patients that we are seeing with the body collapse, some of them, you can see that the airway is so collapsed, that they collapse slightly, it even has positive pressures. You see that right pharynx and tongue just falling back. You see some of those like post MMA, but the guy is generating some huge amount of negative pressure. It's like, and then you see the epiglottis coming in some of them. So there is a, a ventilatory drive difference in some of those patients that is very um, dramatic and different. So um, things are different, but this is something I've thought about a lot, <clears throat> and uh, I think it'd be interesting for you guys to pursue. So we um, people have looked at um, the reverse aging face. In fact, the bony skeleton in the face like, changes with age. For example, the orbit, the, the shape of the orbit changes, uh, becomes larger in some areas. There's also bone deposition by the forehead, loss in the maxilla, protrusion of the maxilla. These lead to soft, that in addition to perhaps laxity of tissues leads to soft tissue descent and lack of support in facial structures for which people like you make a career, right? So why isn't that, what, who's, who was actually asked the question, is that happening to the skull base that's supporting the soft tissues of the, or, the oropharynx? And why couldn't it be happening there? And what it should be. I mean, all those um, bony structures probably are changing um, with age and support of the soft tissue changes. Um, there are folks who've looked at uh, in radiology or plastic surgery looked at, um, you know, the external skeleton, but that would be something that would be interesting. Yeah, we'll bring the so so they look at look at the. I agree. Uh, One of the things that that is profoundly affected by is if you're mouth breathing and you don't have the tongue pressing against the palate, you're going to automatically have a hypoplastic maxilla, mm -hmm. and I think that's underlooked often. Um, so it's a really complex I'm question. I'm talking about suspension of the palate and, the, and all the other things and all the, the bony palate and the suspension of the soft palate <coughs> and the other soft tissue structure. You're looking at it with scopes. So perhaps there's some elements of that too that happens with aging that you don't expect. Partner up with radiology and that. Um, so I know I know Dr. Kolte um, has looked into occult laryngomalacia a lot. So you know, kids who have had oftentimes older kids like teenagers who have had tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy and base reductions who, ha who then still have persistent obstructive sleep apnea and are found to have some kind of collapse at the level of the epiglottis. Um, and I don't know if that's, if that's something that, I mean, maybe the pediatric attendings can weigh in, um, if, if that might be a place to start looking to see if there are analog if there are procedures that are effective or if it seems like the, the physiology and the anatomy are just too different between the two age groups. Um, but I know that, I mean, you know, he published with, uh, uh, with Dylan Chan on this, so I think in the intervening time there's probably been some data accumulated, at least in teenagers, might be closer. It, it is interesting because we just commented, I don't know if you want to comment on anything, because we just actually discussed about that. Uh, my impression is that probably in kids that are presenting with their uh, a part of the problem, I, I don't think the laryngeal a configuration the structure is similar because many of them you're going to see that the collapse is happening at the level of the arrhythmia and it's moving forward yeah. instead of being like a lax epiglottis. The other thing that's very common uh, in children is that the epiglottic flow is very short and part of the procedure that they do, one of the common things that they do is that they actually divide the epiglottic flow in order to release that epiglottis. So that that's true in infantile laryngomalacia, um, but in the occult, ones. so in the occult, yeah. occult laryngomalacia are the ones who sort of made it out, so made it out of the, the early years. Usually talk about or he gives some examples of that arytoglottic uh, folds fold inside and does this supraglottic, supraglottic, supraglottoplasty by lasering yeah. the arytoglottic folds and the arytoglottics. I I don't remember exactly if he presents any technique uh, with the epiglottic. I I just don't remember. 
So I think what's I think what's usually done is the is epiglottopexy. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And there are I agree that there are some that involve the area epiglottic folds, but there are also some that are solely curling of the of the epiglottis, very similar to what you were showing. I think the ones that are the flat epiglottis that collapses back, the, that's not as common in the other thing is I don't know is perhaps uh but the epiglottopexis, uh perhaps in the pediatric cancer much better success index of actually having that thing stay in there. I don't know if adults have a bit longer area or they make more effort. I can mm -hmm. see that stitch going out. I okay. have one patient that those stitches stay in there for a little longer. I don't know what it does during the I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't seen them follow up. I think it stays there most of the time. But the other part of it is usually. Usually when we're doing epiglottal pexy, we're doing it the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing a lingual tonsillectomy, yeah, yeah. demucosalizing the entire lingual surface of the epiglottis, putting a stitch in, and often when you look at those patients afterwards, it's really a kind of healed into that, yeah. Yeah. Into that base of tongue defect. Yeah. I'll try more. I'm trying to help you. One more question. Going, going back to turbulent airflow, has anybody looked at the difference in um, someone who has OSA and take their baseline sleep study and then repeat that sleep study with uh, a lighter gas, less dense gas like Heliox? Uh, I'm pretty sure I've read, I, I cannot recall exactly. I, I've read about that because obviously the density of the gas is going to affect the laminar flow. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I really can, can you recall of a paper or something or a I study? But I've, I've read about it actually, that is something that is described in, in uh, Dr. Good. He, had a, he has a book on obstructive sleep apnea and there's one section that talks about that. I'm gonna look it up and I'll let you know. But uh, definitely, I mean, it, may, it, it makes sense. It's, uh, but it's, it, it, what, what would you think about it in terms of what? What would you, uh, for treatment purposes or for? Well, I wanna know more information about it. Okay. What, what percentage of the, how much effect will it give you if you lighten the uh, density of the gas that's being weak, for example? How much difference does that make? Does the moisture content in the area make a difference? Because that certainly will change the turbulent flow. Yeah. So there's a lot of variables. I think that we're just looking at everything mechanical, and um, you know, I think there's a lot of variables that are not talked about. Certainly, there's obviously a mechanical issue here, mm -hmm. but looking at all the other potential variables, you know, may provide avenues for treating other areas that may potentially help. I mean, that's pretty non-invasive. Mm -hmm. If you show that that's very effective or show some effect, um, yeah, you can use like a candle or something with some sort of different oxygen mix. Whatever it takes. You know, uh, more information is better. Less dense, yeah. There is some, at least a couple of papers on surfaxing mm -hmm. for, uh, for obstructive sleep apnea. It improves mildness and other people. Yeah, we use surfaxing for the And everything was used with really excellent. Very good.